What is the best test for insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is linked to the majority of modern disease. Obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all have a component of insulin resistance. So people want to know how to measure it. For a lot of people, it's enough just to measure your basic glucose and maybe an A1C, but for some, it's not enough. That's not going to tell them the whole picture. So today we're going to talk about HOMA IR, what it can measure, and when it's a good idea to ask your doctor for a test. Coming right up. HOMA IR stands for Homeostatic Model Assessment of Insulin Resistance. Glucose is one indicator of insulin resistance, but glucose varies. It fluctuates a whole lot through the day, so depending on when we catch it, we may or may not get a, a representative value. A1C is a blood glucose average. It measures how much glucose sticks to a red blood cell, and the red blood cell lives about three to four months. So by measuring how much is stuck to a red blood cell, we can get a three to four month average of the glucose. So that's a better measurement, but it still doesn't tell us the whole picture because you could still be insulin resistant and have a normal blood sugar. So let's talk about that. And HOMA IR measures insulin and glucose. And the homeostatic means how good is the body's ability to return, to balance these two factors out, to return to homeostasis. So we multiply the blood glucose by the insulin and we divide by a constant to come up with a score. So there's two factors that drive the score. It's both blood glucose and insulin. So either one could drive up the score and that where it gives us the value. So if you have a normal blood glucose but a high insulin, you're still insulin resistant. And if both are high, then obviously you are also insulin resistant. So let's look at a few examples here. Every time you eat, your body raises blood sugar. The, the food gets into the bloodstream, blood sugar goes up. If you eat carbs, it goes up a lot. If you eat protein, it goes up a little bit. And if you eat fat, it hardly rises at all. Then that blood glucose, the purpose is not to be in the blood. The blood is just a transportation system to get the fuel to the cells because the cells are going to do some work with that fuel. And insulin is what allows the glucose to get out of the blood and into the cell. So it's like a lock key into a lock to open up the door to let the cell use that fuel. So we eat something, our glucose goes up, insulin goes up, it delivers it to the cell. When the cell has the food, then insulin is no longer lead it, needed and insulin goes back down. So that's kind of the normal sequence of things. And the system is set up beautifully because it's self-managing as long as we live a natural life and eat whole healthy foods. If we have a moderate or low amount of blood glucose, it doesn't take much insulin to control that and we have a balanced, a homeostatic situation and our HOMA IR score would be one or less. So let's look at a few examples there. The first example is a person who goes get their blood work, their fasting glucose is 90. We measure their insulin levels, their fasting insulin levels, which come out to 4.5. We plug it into the formula, we multiply glucose by insulin, divide by the constant, and we have 1.0. So this is a person with good insulin sensitivity, meaning it doesn't take a lot of insulin. The body doesn't have to work very hard to deliver that food to the cell. The cell is receptive, it's sensitive to, because it wants that food. So this is a good situation. Uh, their A1C measures 5.5, so their average glucose is about 110. And so they start the day off at 90 and then they eat, but they eat reasonably well. So the blood sugar goes up, it goes a little bit outside of the zone maybe. Uh, if they eat some rice and potatoes and things. But it doesn't climb excessively because they eat whole food 
and it comes back down in the range and the body doesn't have to work very hard. The next example though, that person comes in, get their blood work, their fasting glucose is 85. So if that was all we measured for that person, we go, hey, congratulations, you're in tip-top shape, don't worry about a thing, uh, just keep doing what you're doing. And the person goes off and is heading into trouble. Because if we had also measured insulin, we'd see that it was 10. And this person, their insulin is more than twice that one, even though their fasting glucose is lower. So when we calculate the HOMA IR, we get a 2.1, meaning the body can maintain the blood sugar, especially after a while when you've been fasting, but it has to work really hard at doing so. Then we measure the A1C and we see this person has a 6.3, indicating an average glucose of 134. And there's a big, big difference between the fasting. They, fasting, they look good, but their average is pretty high. So this person is pre-diabetic. And even though if we had sent him off with a congratulations based on the fasting glucose and he keeps doing what he's doing, he is heading for diabetes. So what is he doing? Well, he starts off the day low, but then he eats his milk and cereal and toast with a jam and orange juice. And then he has a hamburger and a Coke. And every time he eats, his blood sugar goes very, very high. It goes way outside that ideal range, which is an emergency and the body has to make a ton of insulin, but the body can still keep up. So the insulin is sufficient to bring it back down to a normal level, especially if you let it work overnight, which is when we take that fasting glucose. So here's an example of where you're developing insulin resistance. You are eating a lot of carbs, a lot of processed food, the blood sugar goes high, a lot of insulin is pushing all that fuel into the cell. And the cell is happy in the beginning and then after a while it says, hey, this is too much, I can't use all this fuel. So the sugar gets converted into fat and the fat starts filling up the cells of the body, especially the liver, which is usually the first place to develop insulin resistance. The cell has had enough. The cell says, I don't want anymore. So it starts resisting insulin. The longer you go without food, the more the cell can start burning off those stores and then it welcomes insulin, you become more insulin sensitive. So this person would do well to start changing some habits before it's too late. The earlier you can catch something, the quicker and easier it is to turn it around. It's never too late, but the quicker you get at it, the easier it is. This is a full-blown type two diabetes patient. Fasting glucose is 200, their insulin is at 20, A1C is at 10, average glucose 240. We calculate their score and it's a 9.9. .9. So here's a very insulin resistant person. And of course, we had no doubt because every marker indicates that there's something out of whack here. They're, if we charted their blood glucose, they are never in the normal range. They never ever get down there because they push their body too far. They start off high every meal they eat which is probably frequent, they increase it, they make massive amounts of insulin, but the cells are so resistant that the massive amount of insulin is not, can't make a dent in it. It fluctuates a little bit up and down, but it stays at a very high level. Even so, the moment this person stops eating carbohydrate, their blood sugar will start to go down. So there is hope even in this case. But what I really wanted to focus on with the HOMA IR is this special case. And this is the person who has tried everything. They might have lost some weight, maybe they plateaued, maybe nothing happened. Maybe it's a person who managed to lose a good bit of weight, but all the remaining weight sits on the midsection. And this could be someone who has eaten really, really well for a long time, maybe for years. 
So we checked them, their fasting glucose is 100. So it's a little bit on, on the high end, but not alarming. We checked their insulin and it's a whopping 20. It's, it's as high with half the blood sugar, it's as high as this one. So their score calculates to 6.2. So they're very, very insulin resistant, but they've eaten well for quite some time. So their blood sugar never goes crazy. And we check their A1C, it's a 5.4. Their average glucose is about 108. So there's hardly any difference between the fasting and the A1C. And in some cases, they could be the same. This person's blood sugar never really budges and yet they can't lose weight. So if we think about this, and, and these, are, these are, I have seen people like this, and every person with this might be different. So don't think that I'm just talking about you, but it could be uh, a large range of cases. So if this doesn't look exactly like you, then just look at the, the principles. So this person might have been on keto. They might be fully fat adapted, the body burns f fat for fuel perfectly. They don't get hungry much, they have no cravings, but they're so insulin resistant that the cells won't release the fuel. Okay, they have all this fuel stored on the body, but it takes extreme measures to release any of it. The body, there's so much insulin there that the body that, that packs the fuel into the cell, that locks the cell down, that the body prefers to eat fat to as opposed to burning it. So this person, if they're on keto, they probably feel a strong urge to maintain their calories, their intake, they get hungry when they don't get food. Because even though they're fat adapted and they have all this fat, they still can't get to it because of all that insulin. So in this case, you probably have to get a little bit more drastic. So a lot of these people have already tried the, the keto, they've tried the calorie restrictions, they've done all those things. Uh, so keto may not be the thing that's going to do it for them. They, it might, low carb is absolutely necessary because if you start loading up the carbs, then their system is going to get even more insulin crazy. Uh, but keto may not be enough. So they need to stay keto and or low carb, but they need to start doing some other things as well. Exercise would be one thing, and they want to do low intensity exercise, something that gets their heart rate to 100, 120, not higher because then you start burning a lot of cortisol, which drives more insulin. They might want to play around with fasting. So even if they've done intermittent fasting, 16-hour uh, fast, 18-hour fast. They probably want to go more toward OMAD, one meal a day, or even longer fasts, like 36, 48, 72 hours. And they might be a little uncomfortable because the body is so resistant to releasing that energy, that fat for fuel. But if they can get over the hump, then they'll probably see some results. And then, of course, then there are also cases where even that may not be enough because there can be other factors that are underlying the problem. So things like hypothyroid, if you're toxic with metals, chemicals, immune toxins, or if you have nutritional deficiencies, then your body is just not in a strong enough place to, to bounce back. All of the things we talked about are still appropriate, but they may not be enough or you may get very slow results. So this is what we specialize at in our office. We analyze the body and find out what are the hidden root causes. So if you've tried everything, then try this and then maybe look if there's someone locally that can help you as well. We do nutrition response testing, which is the best method I've ever found of identifying those things. So let me know if this answers your questions on insulin resistance or if there's anything that you want more clarity on. If you enjoy learning and understanding more than just sort of getting a few facts spelled out, if you feel this is valuable information, 
then make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell. Also share this information with as many people as you can because there's a lot of people out there who need to get healthy. Thanks for watching.